My name is Wayne Cooper. It's November the 30th of 2015 and I'm interviewing a longtime resident of Huntsville. Please introduce yourself by giving your name, year of birth, and birthplace. I'm Peggy Hearn. I was born Peggy Armstrong, well actually Margaret Edith Armstrong, but the only people that know me with that name are people who went to school with me because as soon as I got out of school I dropped the Margaret. Mom called me Margaret when she was cross. <laughs> your birth year and your birthplace. I was born in Toronto in the private patient's pavilion at the Toronto General uh, in 1935. And I've been in Huntsville since 1948 when my father got transferred here to open a new Loblaw store on Main Street. It was the first time they had tried a store in a tourist town area, and so we were really into new things that year. Peggy, uh, what is your place within the Hearn family? Well, I was lucky enough to be married into the Hearn family because I met my husband Jack in uh, uh, 19... Oh, I'd have to think about that. Anyway, it was Labor Day, which we took in the third Monday in September in Huntsville, and I met Jack out at Tasso Lake at a, a, a hunt camp that was part of my friend's family routine, and Jack and his buddy, Bert Budrow, were coming out to pace off the first crown land on Tasso. It was 1951, now I think about it or 52, 52 I guess, um, and, and that was the first time we had met. Even though I'd been in Huntsville for a few years, we just never met. He was out of school and I was still in school in grade 13. So. Over the years you must have learned uh, quite a bit about the, um, the Hearn family history, but what can uh, you tell us about the history just prior to their arrival in Huntsville? Well, I think that originally the family was, like the, my in-law family, was born in Aurelia. The father was Frank Hearn, uh, Jack's father, and his father was John Hearn, who owned a mill, a woolen mill, if I got it right, in Aurelia, and was quite a well-to-do man. Uh, he had uh, six sons and one daughter right in the middle. And Frank was the youngest. Now his uh, brother uh, Russell Bowerman Hearn was the first of the family to arrive in Huntsville and was the founder of Hearn Hardware. Yes. Um, please tell us how and when um, he entered the business in Huntsville and where the first store was located. Well, uh, I, as I understand it, he came to Huntsville to work in the white hardware and I believe it was Alan White, and he was also connected with the Huntsville Planing Mill. And this, as I understand, the Huntsville Planing Mill was, was behind the Hearn Hardware uh, at 36 Main was the address of the hardware store. And uh, Russell came up to work in that hardware store. And I'm not sure what year he came, but he... Um, he wanted some help with doing the book work in the hardware. I don't know if that's when Mr. White went to Huntsville Planing or not. And so Russell, or pardon me, Frank. Frank had been a town clerk in Aurelia, and he came here to do the books in the Hearn Hardware. And that was uh, in 1911. It may just still have been whites at that point, but they worked together in that hardware store. And one of the interesting things about that, from the pictures we've seen, uh, there was a gas pump right on the sidewalk in front of the hardware. And, and we, uh, even in the 60s and 70s, had the measures that for a gallon and a quart. And, and Russell told me one day, about having to pump the, there was the big brown thing on the top and you had to pump the gas up into that and then put the hose in and, and measure a gallon and pour it into the, it must have been a very labor intensive job, but there weren't that many cars of course in those early days. So. Right. 
I've yeah. read accounts where it took uh, about a half hour to put four or five gallons of fuel into a car. Probably, yes. I think that, as I understand it, Dr. Hart had the first car uh, in Huntsville, if I've got it right. So. I believe so. Uh, now, Russell um, Hearn had two brothers, Frank, uh, you, whom you've mentioned. Yes. Uh, that's Jack's father. And Harry, he subsequently came to Huntsville as well. Now, why did he come to Huntsville? Well, Russell's wife uh, unfortunately died in the Spanish flu after the First World War. And she was pregnant at the time. She had a three or four year old Betty um, and, and was having a second child when she got the flu. And apparently all the pregnant women in Huntsville, none of them survived that flu. It, it was a, a very real disaster in town. So it was sometime after that that Harry came uh, yeah. Russell, to help Russell out? Or? Russell went into depression and he just was not able to carry on and he was going to lose the business. Harry had stayed in Oshawa, was where he was working, for Sam McLaughlin, making Buicks. He always had a Buick and he always called it his McLaughlin. And so he got the call from Russell. He'd never married. And he, he sold his McLaughlin stock so that he could come up and buy out his brother. And consequently, and I'm not sure when that exactly was, um, Russell went to work at the Anglo-Canadian Tannery and he's it pictured at the museum in the band, which was world famous at that time. Mm -hmm. So it, it was an interesting thing. And when did your husband, Jack, begin working at the hardware store? Well, he was born in 1929, and he went into the store when he left school at 16. He'd worked Saturdays before that, of course, but he was the only male of the next generation, so it was just assumed that he would come in to work in the store with his dad and with, with uh, Harry. Okay, he was obligated to work at the store, but did he enjoy working there? He loved the people, I think. I think he had other ideas of what he would like to do. He was a ham operator from a very young age, and he even had his pilot's license when he was 19. He used to work down at the Aero Bay Marina on, on Lake Vernon, uh, and he and his buddy, Lauren Briggs, they would clean and, and be the tidy-up men down there, and for that, they got flying license. So, so he had his float pl plane license when he was 19. That's pretty remarkable. Now, when entering the old Hearn hardware, I can vividly recall in the, in the 1960s, it was like walking into a time capsule. Yeah. Please tell us about the antique highlights of that well, store. Some of the antique highlights are still there in the business that's in there now, has been there for many years. Um, it had a metal roof, and it's, it's done in squares that have been, looks like pressed metal, and it's the same, it's never been any different. And in our day, it had an oiled floor, a wood floor that was oiled every Saturday night. Apparently, that's what hardware stores had to smell like because people always would come in and say, oh, that smells just like a hardware store. And along the edges of the walls, we had small or big, bigger green boxes, a horrible green color, and each one had a, a sample of what was inside the box on the outside, so that if you were looking for some specific, you just had to find the right box and pull it open. And of course, it went up right up to the ceiling. So what you did was climb on the ladder and sort of pull yourself along until you got to where you wanted to go. And those two ladders were there over 60 years. And one of them we still have in the family. I think the other one's probably still up in the rafters in the basement because it, we didn't ever sell it. It was an antique that was left there. So. Can you recall what happened to the counters? Oh, yes. There was a long, long cherry counter. 
I can't remember, but I think it was over 30 feet. And we didn't want to move it out. The, the doorway wasn't that big. And so um, what happened was that one of the men who was working around at the time, and I can't think who what his name was, he said he would cut it in three to get it out of the store. And so he took a couple of the long pieces and somebody else took the third piece. And we were we just gave them away because we were glad to see them go out. Mm -hmm. And that was later later in early 70s that we did that. Took out all the boxes, that construction man took all the boxes and he also took the samples because nobody wanted to be bothered taking them off. And off he went quite happy with them. I don't know where they were going, but we were just glad to see them go because we had made arrangements to have the whole inside renovated and put a new front window in. So uh, that was when Jack and I were involved, yeah. So. Uh, what happened to the old way scale? Ah, uh, it's it it's got stories to tell too. Uh, when our daughter was born in 1959, and there was all men working in the store because it was not for women at that time. It was a hardware store, and so uh, I used to take her uptown in her carriage in the beginning, and then the men I'd just wheel it right into the store, and then they would all just be gaga about this baby because she was a beauty and and so they put a piece of brown wrapping paper you know they came in the rolls on the way scale and then I'd put the baby on it and they could tell me how many ounces she gained in the last week or two out uh, you know two weeks or whatever but they got more kick out of her and she loved it because there was all these people paying attention to her, you see. So we did that for a while. Then when we sold the store, we left the way scale and that's probably there to this day, I don't know. Unless, it, no, I don't think we sent it to the museum, but anyway, it certainly was museum worthy of it, yeah. So you did send some pieces to the museum? Oh yes, yes. Still now, as far as I know, there is a, what we had for a gun cabinet and it had glass doors, glass all around it, and the gun stood up in it. And then when it wasn't, um, it, that was all for fall, but earlier it was sort of pushed aside and then there was fishing tackle stuff in there. And so... Uh, when Ted Bionda came to us, he was a, a hunter fisherman type, a good fisherman. Jack had no interest. His dad was a fisherman, and Harry was a fisherman, but Jack had no interest. He'd rather just canoe than, than to fish. And so he said to Ted, you take over and look after that. So Ted did a lot of, of upgrading there with things. I got into trouble there at one point too, but that's another story because a man came in and the, the fellas were always teasing me. When I first went in there, I was as green as grass. I'd never been involved in hardware at all. And so this man said to me, do you have frog harness? And I got a very puzzled look on my face. And I said, what do you want it to pull? <laughs> And I, the men, they were just killing themselves. I still had no idea what a frog harness was. So anyway, they enlightened me and had a good laugh. But, you know, they teased me so much, I was never sure what, whether they were teasing or whether it was something I was supposed to know about. And I didn't know, that was for sure. But we did sell horse harness, so, you know, I mean... Anyway, that was one of my gaffes. I had a couple. In the same vein, I think someone was sent over to Hearn Hardware to ask for a skyhook. Oh yeah, we've had that kind of thing. The, the one that I blew on was, was uh, a left-handed um, left monkey wrench. Now we had left-handed scissors, which I knew about, but I, ne I wouldn't even have been sure sure what a monkey wrench was. But a left-handed one, I didn't know. But later on, one of the summer kids got sent up to Ecclestones for a left-handed monkey wrench, and he didn't know what he was going for either. 
So <laughs> it wasn't just me that got teased. Well, that's a wonderful yeah. story. Um, that, that old store uh, doubled as Harry's residence. Oh, yes. Please tell us more about that. Well, Harry was a bachelor, and he had no use for women. And so he had, had stayed with Russell and his wife, no, it's not Russell, Frank and his wife, Dot, uh, and he boarded with them, but then he and Dot didn't see eye to eye sometimes, and so he converted what had probably been an office into a bedroom, and that was his living quarters, and he cooked on a hot plate, very seldom because he spent a lot of time in different restaurants in town. But um, it, it was very, very, very um, pioneer style living. So his washroom was a basin right out in the store at the head of the stairs. And, and his toilet facilities were in the basement. And when they put the, the uh, uh, pipes in for the sewage, they had to raise it up three steps because of the sewage way it had to go. And, and my children always referred to it as the throne in the basement. And as far as I know, it's probably still there because nothing's changed on the main street. So. It could be. Yeah. Um, before the end of Harry's tenure in 1965, there was a major change in the business. Oh, so yes. What occurred? Well, at that point, before that, you had salesmen coming around all the time, and we had big books, which Brian still has, of, of um, catalogs for like Hollinger Hardware and Cochrane Dunlop Hardware and um, different companies that their salesmen came around, took an order, and then eventually the order came in. It was very archaic for modern times. And uh, so the Hollinger Hardware people had been and into the states to see different setups that the Americans were doing. And three men uh, that were involved with Hollinger Hardware decided that they would take a, a, a new approach in, in Canada and they would form a home hardware's, uh, it's not a franchise, each dealer owns his own share it doesn't matter if you have one store or 16 stores, you have one vote so that everybody was equal. And they went around and, and asked each store that had been dealt with them for years with the salesmen if they would like to pay to join this confederation. And Harry thought that it was a silly idea. And Jack came home and he tried to explain it to me and I said, it's just like Loblaws, that's something I'd been aware of with my dad involved all the time. And I said, you do far better buying in bulk and then splitting it up later. Then I said, that's the idea of what they're doing. Now persuade Harry that he's got to come up. He was a little tight with his money that if he would do this, it would be the makings of him. And lo and behold, he did. So we were charter members. There were 115 stores originally. Now there are over 1,100. And it is probably the, the thing that made Hearn Hardware where it was then Hearn Home Hardware. Right. And so that was, that was the best move. I think it was the future. Now, when, when Harry passed away in, in 1969, yeah. um, there was a passing of the torch at Hearn Hardware. Can you tell us about that transition? Yes, I can. Um, Harry was, was never um, sick. I can't ever remember him being sick. And once uh, before, about a month before this, he had been a little bit off. Uh, bilious and, and we thought he had the flu and he didn't come out of his room for a couple of days. Well then Jack went in one morning and he could hear Harry calling and he went in and Harry said I really am in trouble. I don't have a doctor. And Jack said well I'll call down because Dr. Aska and Dr. Cluchet were down on the main street and were handy. 
And as it happened, it was Dr. Cluche who was in call or in that day. And so Dr. Cluche came right up, walked up the street and came in. And he said to him, you're, you're in real trouble and I'm going to take you to the hospital. And he wasn't going to the hospital. And Dr. Cluche said, I didn't ask you. I'm telling you. So he put him in the car and took him to the hospital. And as it happened, it was, it was a blockage of some type. And he was in real trouble. And Harry came, or dear me, Dr. Cluche came back and he said to Frank, does Harry have a will? He's no, no wife, no family. And Frank said to him, I'm not sure. He always said he did, but I have no idea. So anyway, he went back to the hospital and he said to Harry, Mr. Hearn, a man of your age really needs to have a will. Do you have a will? And he said, well, I always meant to get one. And so he said, who's your lawyer? And he said, well, I guess it would be Peter Tobias. That's who I've talked to. Well, Dr. Cluche went and phoned the Tobias office. Peter was in court that day, but his girl, Shirley Rogers, came right to the hospital, wrote down what Harry wanted, and he, she said, uh, when Mr. Tobias comes back tomorrow, I will send him over with a copy of this so you can read it through with him and sign it. And thank the good Lord that's what happened because within 72 hours he was dead. Amazing story. Yes. Well, that's small town, mm -hmm. you know. So, so um, Peggy, when did you begin working in in the in the store? It's hard to believe that you could work under Harry. So what? I did not. <laughs> he wouldn't have it. <laughs> no, he. I never remember a woman in there um, until I went in, because um, Jack never did books, and books are my. I was a teacher for fifteen years. But um, I, I always had a wish to be a chartered accountant. So it was natural when he's looking for somebody to do the books that I would go in and help out. And I thought I was just helping out because Jack's dad had slipped and had cracked his hip and they told him he was to be off work for two months bed rest. And he... <laughs> He got hooked on one of the soap operas, and he never wanted to come back. <laughs> he was only 80 at the time. Only so 80. so mm -hmm. I went... He wasn't quite in. ready to retire. No. <laughs> and he wasn't quite ready when he discovered that I was there, and I had changed his bookkeeping methods, which were from 1911, I swear. And uh, so then he never did come back, because he didn't want to get into this modern stuff. Right. So that was the beginning of your work career at the store. Mm -hmm. Now in uh, 1973, you and Jack left the Main Street location and opened a new store on Haynes Street. We didn't leave it, Wayne. You no. never? No. Well, we did eventually, but in 1973 we opened the store at Haynes Street. And then we were running both. Oh, okay. And had three children at home and it got very, very confusing at times. And so we talked it over with Ted. Ted was a wonderful worker, and he'd been with us since he was 14 on, on Saturdays. That's Ted and Beyond it. Ted Beyond it, yes. Mm -hmm. And so we talked to him. We had never owned the store uptown. We paid rent from 1911. But um, we offered to sell him the business uptown and the fixtures, which we had replaced when when we sold all the other stuff. Uh, it was Home Hardware that designed the up, Uptown store and and we changed it. We changed it about 1970, I think. And it was such a big success. Uh, we also took out the Home Hardware catalogs and that was an overwhelming success. So So we decided that we had to get bigger. We were encouraged by Home Hardware, and Walter Hackborn, who was the general manager and president, 
and we we went down and spoke to him, and then we we bought the the building at Haines Street, which was in very bad physical condition, and so we had it renovated right from the walls are new and the roof was new. Um, but we had to keep the same footprint because the town wouldn't let us have that biggest a building on with the new regulations on that size of lot. So we were at 4 Haines Street. Yes, that's another funny story. I don't know if you want funny stories, but Absolutely. at this point, CCAR had opened in Huntsville. And it was um, it had some opening problems, I think, and it had some quite young young uh, operators and, and uh, announcers. And so we decided to have a radio ad. And we, we were encouraged by home hardware to, to do that, you see. We'd never done that, never had a radio station. So we, we wrote out this ad for, for CCAR. And it was when, well, we'd done a couple from the Main Street, but this was when we opened the Happy Hearn Home Hardware on Haines Street in Huntsville. Well, this young announcer one day <laughs> got on the air, and it was like Peter Pepper, Peter Pep, oh, you know what I'm saying. He could not say Happy Hearn Home Hardware on Hain Street in Huntsville. And it, it, like it was supposed to be a 30 second ad, it lasted about two minutes and finally he said, you know where it is, <laughs> and, and went on to the next one. It was the best advertising we ever had because people were still laughing about a month later about this kid. Uh, I, anyway, he did well for us, very well. That was so, a wonderful story. Yeah. I hadn't heard that one before. Well, do you remember when Z-Car first opened? It was I, yes. really a cowboy station. Yes. It's come a long way. Garth Thomas. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. yeah, and the whole nine yards. Yeah, well, it was a wonderful uh, time. I, I was just finishing grade eight actually when the when yeah. the radio station first came to town. Yeah, and I have some wonderful memories of that time. Now we've talked about uh, Ted Beyond as being one of your employees, and I don't know if you have anything. Any more accolades to, to pass on that way about uh, Ted? Oh, uh, Ted, Ted was a great guy to work with and, and still is. I mean, I work with his, his wife now in the hospital auxiliary, so I see a bit of them both. Yeah, they're great guys. Yeah. Now, I'd like you also to, uh, to tell us about a few other people that worked at Hearn Hardware, and I'd like to start with you yourself. Oh. As an employee of Hearn Hardware, you've told us a little bit about your yes. your bookkeeping prowess, yeah. but um, perhaps you could tell us what other things you were particularly good at. Maybe talking the men into something talking. more. Talking, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> yeah. No, um, uh, I had had worked at Loblaws all the years I was in high school and, and when I was in, in college uh, to, to help pay for my schooling and everything. So I was quite familiar with the cash register. Uh, before that, we had one that you cranked and the drawer came open, and, and you just got the till slip. You didn't have anything else. So I persuaded them to buy a national cash register. And that was a big change. And when we did the changeover at the old store, we put in a, a counter and a cash register, you see. So then we needed to have somebody run it. So I ran it, and then I uh, stole from from uh, Eaton's a cash cash person in the form of Elva Harper, and she was a great asset in the business because she looked after giftware, which was something brand new, you know. Harry would have rolled if he thought we were selling giftware in a hardware store. But anyway, that was part of the home hardware's renovation. So she was there. And then when we got so busy, I got uh, my friend Bernice Smith to come from Rightway Cleaners. And she and Elva and I were the cash register persons. The men would do it if they were forced to, but they tried not to. And they were the hardware p persons. Uh, Jerry Jennings. Oh, Jerry was a, yeah, he was a prize. We had the cleanest hardware store, I bet, in the whole home hardware chain when we got Jerry. 
he came to us when Boyd's grocery store was closed. Uh, he had been the delivery man for Boyd's. He had been the cleanup man at Boyd's. And he did all the um, hay and grains and sunflower seeds and stuff that Boyd's sold. Well, when Boyd's closed, there was nowhere. So he asked Jack if he would carry on with the seeds and feed sort of stuff with Muskoka produce from Bar Bracebridge. He bought it, we bought it from them. And then Jerry was the one in charge in our store. And he was really good at it. He was also a volunteer fireman, which was great because we were right across the street from the town hall and the fire hall. And so if the fire whistle went, you just saw Jerry as a streak going out the door, which came in handy because one Christmas, and we had front, front windows that you could put displays in, in the old store. Mm -hmm. And so Ted did a great job with a Christmas display. He put cotton batten on the floor and a, um, an artificial tree with lights. And, and then he had a coffee maker and a, an electric fry pan and, you know, the kind of things we did sell that were hardware. And, and he uh, just finished it just finished it and said to, to uh, Gore, one of the other fellows, plug that in and we'll see if the lights are all going. Well, whatever happened when he plugged it in, there was a spark. Hit the cotton batten and started a flame. Bill McCaffrey, who was a fire chief, was walking up the street just as a coincidental thing from his coffee break saw the spark, came running into the store, yelled at Jerry, call the fire department. And he picked up this cotton batten. There was fry pans this way, toaster this way, and he outside stamped it off, right like that, before the truck even got called. And he came back in, and he, he didn't burn his hands. He had leather gloves on. And, and he said to Jerry, why didn't you call the, the real? Jerry said, because any time one of us firemen calls the real, we have to buy a case of beer for the next steps, night that we're together. And he said, I wasn't prepared to do that. <laughs> so we tried to buy Bill McCaffrey a new pair of gloves. He wouldn't, that's part of the job. Imagine that. Yeah, and he worked for the opposition. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Now, you had a number of employees um, that were not family. I'd like to get back to family oh, in a okay. moment, but in the meantime, uh, would you make some comments on uh, people like Roger Martin? I remember him being there for almost ever. Roger Martin worked at Parkland and the, the sold, what, Dodge in Plymouth, I think, after Mr. Jupp sold out. And, and he, uh, I don't know what happened at Parkland, he came and asked if, if we had a job for him. Well, when we were into home hardware and put their catalog out, we needed more help. And he, I'd gone to school with Roger, so I knew him, and uh, he was a good man. He is a good man still. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Gord Hunter. Oh, Gord. Gord and Orm Lake were the two that were what I call stalwarts. Orm Lake had been our glass salesman. And so he got to retirement age. And he and his wife moved to Huntsville because they liked it here. And he came and he said, I, I'm getting restless. I really am getting restless. He said, have you got a job for me? Well, Jack said, you know, I've done all the screens for years. I've done all the window glass. And he said, I'm getting too busy to do all that. If you would come, particularly spring and summer, and do those things for me, and you can learn the rest of the hardware, but you know that very well, and he did, and he came. And then if we needed to go away for a hardware show, or if we needed to go away for a holiday, then Orm would come in and, and do what was needed in glass and screening, but also he learned the hardware business. Well, Gord, he was a, a government employee down in Hamilton Way, and he had a, a yen to move here because he'd been here for summers. 
So he and his wife moved here. They had one boy still in high school, and they, they had a construction company build them a shell of a house, and then Gord made the whole inside of the house. He did the carpentry, he did the electrician stuff, and all that. And so we knew he had been a, a part-time thing while he was doing his main work, and he was ready now to come in and work in a hardware. So he worked with us the same thing, at spring and summer and until after Thanksgiving. And then if we didn't, oh, and he stayed for hunting season because he wasn't a hunter, then um, that meant that Jerry could go hunting because in our business in hunting season, there was no carpenters, no electricians, nobody of our clientele that was left in town, it seemed to me, for the two weeks of hunting season. So they would come when we needed them like that. And they were a great help to us, yeah. So we had a very varied kind of background with the people that worked with us. And it was a good team, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, would you make a brief comment on your father-in-law, Frank Hearn, and how he, his life uh, around the hardware business and his knowledge of it, things like that? He started with, with Whites and then went on to Hearn Hardware. Uh, he never owned Hearn, Hearn Hardware, but he in hardware business, uh, Stanley gives a golden hammer to anybody who works 50 years in, in the hardware business. And through Home Hardware, we applied to Stanley, and he was awarded 54 years for his golden hammer. And Walter Hackborn from Home Hardware came up and presented it to him. Wow. And we have a wonderful picture with the grandchildren and grandpa when he got his, his golden, uh, hammer. golden hammer. Yeah, Brian's got it too. Brian wanted all the memorabilia. And he has the old um, wooden cabinets that we kept all the big um, uh, catalogs in. And he has the catalogs. And then he's made almost a little Hearn Hardware Museum in his home uh, because he, he didn't want to get into hardware. He's a carpenter. He loves wood, but he wanted to work outside. He didn't want to work in the stores. He never was in retail. So, To clarify for our audience, uh, who is Brian exactly? Oh, Brian's my older son, yeah. Okay. yeah. We have a daughter and two sons. Now, you can speak about your husband, Jack, uh, in many different facets of his life, but uh, let's just stick, first of all, to the hardware business. Uh, what was his forte, do you think, in, in the hardware business? He was a locksmith. He was the one that they called if they lost their keys or if it got locked out or if the bank people lost their keys for their, their safety deposit boxes, he'd go in and drill them out and put a new lock in and that kind of thing. He's even been known to get over the transom and into a locked place because he was a little bit skinnier than most people and he could get in there. So, uh, yeah, 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 quite an interesting life that way. Mm -hmm. I guess he was never called to get into that uh, vault next door uh, at the old Dominion <laughs> Bank building. <laughs> no, no. Well, he was in it, but he was, he was only in it for a customer, <laughs> yes. Now, um, we're winding down here, but one thing I would like to talk to you about is uh, one of the legacies of Hearn Hardware was always carrying one of everything. Oh, yeah. Well, Could you tell us about at least one story related to that? Yes, I can, because this is something that they were laughing about at Home Hardware. Apparently, a lady tourist had started out somewhere north of Sault Ste. Marie to find a something particularly uh, for her her things in her household. And she went and she asked uh, in the home hardware in the Sioux, and they said, no, we don't stock it. And she said, well, we're heading south. Where will we go? And he said, well, there's home hardwares in, in Sudbury. Um, if you're going down Parry Sound Way, there's one in Parry Sound. And if you're going into Muskoka, go to Hearns in Huntsville. And this couple tried at each place, and at Parry Sound they said, oh yes, if you go over to Huntsville, they'll have it. And so the couple came in and very, you know, 
apologetic almost, like, I need, and it was a, a glass bowl for a Cory coffee maker, which all the resorts here had Cory, so, you know, you could keep one pot warm and make another pot, and the restaurants, mm -hmm. we had a coffee maker's park. She, the lady was just astounded. And I guess all these other home hardwares were interested to know because as soon as we went to the hardware show, when they saw our ticket that we were from Huntsville, they said, did you have a Cory coffee maker? And I said, yes. And they said, why would you stock that? And I, well, because all the resorts we have have Cory's parts and, and our Cory machines, and we have to have some parts. We'll have one of each of these things, and then we sell it, and by Wednesday we can have it in again when our truck comes. So that was that story went right round home hardware. Marvelous yeah. story. Oh, well, Hearn Hardware was an institution in Huntsville for about 65 years. Yeah. Christmas of 1976 marked the beginning of the end. Yeah. Please explain the circumstances behind selling the business and how you and Jack felt. Well, it's hard to say how we, how we felt, but I can remember that very, very clearly. I was in the office in the new store. Ted had bought the other store about a year and a half before, so we didn't have any worries about that. That was his. Um, I'm sitting in the office. The place is just moving with people. Our catalog was a big success that year, and, and things just went out, out, out. And you see, the carpenters and the electricians and all the, the workers around counted on us for things at Christmas. So Christmas afternoon, not Christmas, but like 24th afternoon, these fellas quit work early and they'd come in for the last minute shopping for their wives. And Elva and Bernice were up front and I was in the office and the fellas were doing their thing. And, and it got to 5, 5.15. I had my Christmas shopping hidden in the back of the store for the kids. None of it was wrapped. I still had another hour or two to do with getting, we banked every night with the night deposits and I hadn't done the night deposit and I'm, I'm just about frantic. And so um, we did close the store and then Bernice and, and uh, Elva they decided on their own to stay and they wrapped with me until we finished all the wrapping for my family at home. And they had families at home too and I really did appreciate it. And then I, I sat down after I got home at night and, and the parcels were wrapped and everything. And I wrote to Walter Hackborn because he had been a real mentor to us when we started out. We were young at the time we started, in, in comparison to what had been. And uh, I said to him, it's just before, well, it was almost midnight. And I said, I have no Christmas spirit. I am so tired. We've had a fantastic Christmas. But it's not the Christmas that I want for my family, and Jack agrees with me. And so I said, I know that you have people coming to see the warehouse and to talk to you about getting into home hardware. And I'll, I'll talk to you again in early January, but as of this moment, Jack and I would entertain any thoughts about selling out. And we'll be definite by early January, but this is something you can think about too. And I gave it to Jack to read and he agreed with me and we decided we would wait till the holiday was over and mail it. And within two, two months we had four definite people, or groups, there were couples and, and there was two couples, brother and sister and their spouses who came and, and they 
uh, had been sent by Home Harbor. So it was never listed per se, but it was for sale. And, and so we did. We sold it the 1st of May in 1977 to a lovely couple. He had been a district manager for Zellers. And he'd been down in Maritimes and he wanted to get back to Ontario because the in-laws and his parents were getting older and they didn't want to be way down the Maritimes. So uh, we, we thought they were a great couple. They had four children. And the first question they asked is, what's the school situation like? And what's the church situation like? And I said to Jack, those people have, are our kind of people. Because church and school were very important to our family. So, and are very important. So, yes. So well, that's, Peggy, that's, that, that's a wonderful story. Um, uh, and, and you've passed along so many others as well. I'd like to thank you very, very much for sharing all of that with us. Well, unfortunately for you, you got the right person. I love to talk. And my mother always said in high school, and I went to high school here at Huntsville High, um, I, I won a, a couple of times the oratorical things. My brother and I won in the same year, he in the junior and I in the senior. And uh, so that was an interesting thing. But when my mother saw a silver cup coming in, she said, is that yours? And I said, yes. And she said, oh, that's it. She said, now they've given her a cup, she'll never shut up. <laughs> Thanks again, Peggy. Yeah, good, thank you.